If I had known I'd get applause for chocolate chip cookie dough, I would have brought a bowl of it instead of tea, but sorry. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. So today I want to start off by telling you a story about a girl I once encountered. Like me, she was Eastern European, except where exactly she was from, nobody knew, because when the police found her wandering the streets of Dublin, she was so traumatized that she couldn't speak a single word. She was a young girl, maybe 14, 15 years old, and she'd clearly been through a really awful experience. So the police took her in, they brought her to a psychiatrist, they you know, gave her a room to stay, they tried to figure out who in the world was this person. Within a few days, she got comfortable enough that she started trying to communicate. She still couldn't speak, but she could draw. And so she started drawing pictures. She wasn't much of an artist. But these drawings were beyond disturbing. There she was, as a little stick figure, being taken onto an airplane by what looked like a group of men. And there, that little stick figure was lying on a bed with a group of men surrounding her. So it became pretty clear pretty quickly that she was a victim of sex trafficking, probably from Eastern Europe. And so the police really devoted every single one of their resources to trying to figure out who she was so that they could reunite her with her family and so that they could actually make this girl's life better because she had gone through so much. She was in a foreign country. She, she needed to be made whole. And so they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of man hours. I mean, these people went door to door looking for every missing girl, missing person lead, trying to figure out who she was. And finally, they did something that you never do, which is release her picture to the media. And you don't do this with minors, because obviously there are lots of problems with it. But they decided that they just needed a lead. And it paid off. They did find out her identity. Her name was Samantha, or Sammy, as a party. Except here's the thing about Sammy. When they found out who she was, they also found out a few other things. She wasn't Eastern European like me. She was Australian. She wasn't a teenager. She was 27 years old. She spoke perfect English, was from a pretty wealthy family, and had never been abused a day in her life. Sammy was a serial imposter a con artist, and her breed of con was to be a victim. So by the time we catch up with her in Ireland, she has already been charged with fraud twice in Australia. She has had over 30 aliases. She has played the victim card so many times, it's not even funny, so she's been the victim of family abuse. She tried to get a family to adopt her. They started a legal adoption process to get her away from abusive relatives. She pretended that her parents and her twin, she didn't have a twin, died in a terrible car crash in Switzerland. Over and over and over again, she does this, and people believe her. And when she's deported from Ireland, she ends up actually coming back to Ireland as an au pair, cares for two children. And then she gets kind of sick of it because no one's catching her. And so she leaves. She goes to Canada, does this again. Canada spends hundreds of thousands of dollars before they figure out this is Samantha as a party. And believe you me, her story is far from over. So when I first encountered her, my first feeling was disbelief, and then my second feeling was rage, because I'm a storyteller too. I mean, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist. I tell stories for a living, and I really live by the mantra that what I do matters, that you know, the pen is mightier than the sword, that stories make a difference, that stories actually matter in people's lives. And here was this woman who was using storytelling for really terrible ends, and I realized, you know, stories are powerful. The pen is mightier than the sword. But in the wrong hands, stories can be a force for evil, not a force for good. And that's actually what I want to talk about today, the negative power of stories. We always think of stories as something good. But stories can be incredibly dangerous. And in fact, I think they are some of the most dangerous things in the world. So stories are 
I think, the oldest language we have. They predate verbal language. So you have, you know, you can imagine these cavemen telling stories to each other before they could talk. You know, there's a bear out there, or the river is angry, it's going to flood. All sorts of explanations, all sorts of stories. We have the Lascaux cave paintings. We have storytelling in the most primitive forms for hundreds of thousands of years. And in fact, when psychologists looked at the power of storytelling, they found that nonverbal cues, things that predate language, are much more powerful than verbal cues. So what they did was, take a tape of actors in a play and then play around with the sound so that it was a bit distorted and a, a bit difficult to figure out what exactly was going on. And they found that tone of voice was 22 times more predictive of how people would judge the action than the words themselves. Then they distorted the tape completely so that you couldn't understand a single language, a single word, and they found that Nonverbal cues taken together were four times more accurate at figuring out the action than verbal cues. So people were still really, really good, even when language was entirely absent. Of course, this is why Sammy has a party. She knows this, she's really good. She gets sick of telling stories, everyone believes her, so she becomes mute, and everyone still believes her because her nonverbal cues tell the story so incredibly powerfully. So we have kind of these things going on all the time. And when I, when I looked at that particular study, I said, yeah, sure, but these are actors, right? They're in a play. They're overacting. They're dramatizing all of this. We're not like this normally. But con artists are. They are actors. They're consummate storytellers. They are people among us who do this for a living, who do act out, who do figure out how to prey on our emotions, how to get us into a story to the point where we believe it, where we stop questioning. Because what kind of person am I going to be if a little girl, scared girl, comes up to me and looks like she's in trouble? Am I going to say, excuse me, I'd like to verify your identity, please? Are you sure you were abused? Do I, can I have some proof, please? Um, there, was a, there was a man in, in England who used to love to come up to people and say that he ran out of money for gas to go to the hospital because his daughter had cancer and was having surgery. What are you going to say? Can I see some medical records? That would make you an absolutely terrible human being, right? I mean, you don't, of course you're going to give them money, give them a ride, help this poor girl. You are not a monster. They know this. And so they create the story where you are the good guy. You're actually helping. And to be skeptical in that moment is to betray something wonderful about your humanity, about your view of yourself and the kind of person you want to be in the world. Fortunately, people do this over and over and over. And there's something else about stories. They don't actually have to be so kind of emotionally fraught to have this effect. It turns out that we believe stories much more than we believe anything else. So we can argue with logic, we can argue with facts, you know, you can break it down, say, well, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. But a story is much more difficult to break down in that sort of way. And people often end up believing things in it, even though they really shouldn't. So in 1997, a Princeton University psychologist, Deborah Prentice, decided to see what would happen if I tell people they're reading fiction. So she actually took excerpts from novels, for instance, The Liar of Orpheus, which was a novel from the 80s, and she looked at what would happen when there were facts embedded in those. Would people later believe those facts as true, even though they were part of fiction? So in The Liar of Orpheus, there's a character, Maria, no relation, um, who, who says something about fetal alcohol syndrome. She says that you have to drink quite a lot in order for there to be a problem. Now, scientifically, this is absolutely false. Um, so you only have to drink a tiny bit. It's all about the timing, not the amount consumed. It, the details don't matter, but she was totally wrong. And so what Prentice found was that people actually believed that as scientific fact. 
they decided, oh, this must be true, even though I'm reading a novel. And this happened over and over with different modified excerpts, including things like, the sun is actually good for you. It's great for your skin, let's go sunbathing. People are like, oh, I didn't realize that. You know, vitamins, all sorts of stuff, cool. Awesome, I have all of this new information. Let me go act on it. And what I want to stress again is that we're talking about fiction here. People knew they were reading novels, and yet somehow the facts made it past their perception, and they started believing them. They didn't question them because the story was engrossing, and they just had no reason to question it. And I think that's a big part of it. We need a reason to question. You don't question, you know, when you meet someone new at a party, and they say, hey, my name is Maria. You're like, oh, where are you from? What do you do? You're, you're not there Googling me, be like, wait, how do you spell your last name again? Uh-huh, wait, hold on, where did you say you worked? One second, I'll be right back. We don't do that. We kind of assume that what people tell us is the truth. And unless we have a, a reason to question it, you're listening to a story. It's not like someone's giving you a logical argument, right? You, you, you just kind of go along with it. So your previous speaker talked about kind of this two-stage model um, of, of um, understanding the world. And Daniel Gilbert at Harvard University has done a lot of work on this. And I actually call it the pink elephant view of the world because when I say pink elephant, for a second you have pink elephants gallivanting you know, around in the streets before you realize, oh, pink elephants don't actually exist, right? So this is the two-step process that he talked about. First you believe, just for a millisecond, and then you verify. But in a story, all the pink elephants get by you because you don't realize they're pink. You think that they're actually just quite normal. And there's one theory that this happens because stories transport us emotionally. And the more transported we are, the more likely we are to believe them. So there was a study that was done at Yale based on Sherwin Newland's How We Die, which was a collection of essays. Um, and there was one essay in particular about this little girl, Katie, this was a true story, who got killed in a mall by someone who had escaped from a mental institution. And what the researchers found was that if you presented the story kind of as a news account, and then if you presented it as a narrative, as Sherwin Newland did, two very different things happened. So they asked people to do what's known as Pinocchio circling. After you're done with the story, go back and circle everything that's like Pinocchio's nose. Everything that might not be true, everything that might be off, are there any red flags, any inconsistencies, any logical arguments that aren't quite making sense. They had no problem doing this with the newspaper accounts. They had all sorts of problems doing it with the story. They said, oh, there's nothing wrong. Everything is totally fine. And at the end of it, their opinions about mental health care had changed at the end of the story rather than the newspaper account. All of a sudden, they wanted much harsher policies, much harsher kind of ways of dealing with mental health patients. So these effects actually went quite deep because people were so transported by Katie's story and so horrified at what had happened to her. And they didn't realize that there were all sorts of things there that weren't quite making sense. And you know, when I, when I first went through all this research, when I first read Prentice's study, I was like, you know, this is kind of BS in the sense that maybe in a laboratory this is the case, but I'm not someone who reads fiction and actually takes it for fact. And then I had a dinner conversation one night, and I was telling people about the streetcars in 1800s New York, and how Union Square used to be really dangerous because the streetcars went too quickly around the corners and they'd hit people. Um, and so there were a lot of fatalities because the streetcar design was actually a little off. And my friend said, oh my God, this is totally fascinating. I've actually been looking for a good history of New York. Where did you find this? And I thought about it and I said, oh, it was not novel I read last year. <laughs> So I realized that I had just given a five-minute lecture on streetcars in New York based on a novel. I have no idea how well this author did his research. I don't know if it was actually true, but I realized at that point, you know, the way our minds work, you have pink elephants gallivanting around Union Square hitting people all the time, and you don't actually realize what is going on. That 
is how powerful stories are. And they are, I mean, think about how they permeate our lives. I mean, our lives are based on stories. We're in the middle of an election right now. Talk about storytelling in politics, right? <laughs> You've got politicians telling stories. You've got journalists telling stories about politicians, which in turn affects how your narrative works. You have this in Silicon Valley, entrepreneurs and their origin stories. Who is going to get funded? Who is going to get the most money? The person with the best idea or the person with the best origin myth? Now, I won't name any names, but you know, if I, for instance, dyed my hair really blonde and put on a black turtleneck and said, you know, I dropped out of Stanford because I'm really brilliant and I have this great test for blood that's only going to be a skin prick, you're going to give me billions of dollars because that's such a cool story and I'm such a cool person to talk about it. But if I don't have any of that, then you'll be like, oh, I don't know, let's wait and see. Maybe we'll, we have to see a proof of concept. You need the story first in Silicon Valley, not the proof of concept. And it's not just Silicon Valley. I don't mean to pick on them. It's, it's all over the place. In law, they say that the person who wins the case isn't the better lawyer with the better evidence. It's the lawyer who tells the better story. Because what is the jury looking at? They're looking at the storytelling. They're not looking at the facts. We'd like to think that we are creatures of fact, but we really, really aren't. And this, to me, is profoundly disturbing because what you realize when you encounter people like as a party is that stories don't have a moral compass of their own. Stories just exist, and they're beautiful, and they're powerful, but we're the moral compass, the storyteller. And so you can have them in the wrong hands do really awful things. So let me, let me tell you about another gentleman I, uh, I found while I was researching my book. So he, this was back in the Korean War. I had never met him. He died in early 90s. And he was a doctor. And he enlisted in the Canadian Navy when nobody wanted to. And he was appointed. The, the Navy was thrilled that someone with his qualifications would want to join because there was a real shortage of people who wanted to volunteer for Korea. Um, and so he was assigned to a ship um, with hundreds of soldiers under his care. And they sailed off to the Korean seas. He was the only medical officer on board. And one day they found a boat filled with people who'd been in an ambush, Korean nationals, but allies, um, which, you know, it's, it's a war that happens. And so the captain of the ship said, Dr. Sear, that was his name, would you operate on, this, on these men? Because they'll surely die without your help. But you don't have, you know, he didn't have to because they weren't Canadian and his mandate was just for Canadians. But he, being the hero he was, the volunteer, he said, of course I will. And so he performed 18 surgeries in 24 hours and these men were saved and left. Except this guy had never finished high school, let alone going to medical school. This, these were his first surgeries. He had no medical background whatsoever, but he was really good at stealing credentials. His name was Ferdinand Waldo de Mara, the great imposter. And over his career, he impersonated not just a surgeon who performed surgeries, but an engineer who almost got an assignment to build a bridge in Mexico. Can you imagine how that would have worked out? Um, a college professor. This guy founded a college in Maine that actually still exists. He was, this was my favorite actually, he was a Texas prison warden. So this was the only time he was ever in prison. <laughs> As a warden, taking care of prisoners. And do you know why he was finally caught in Texas? He gave a cover, uh, he gave a, a copy of Life magazine where he was on the cover as the great imposter to one of the inmates because he was so proud of himself. And there's honor among thieves, the inmate turned him in. <laughs> so someone like Damara, you know, makes you realize that these people, you know, he didn't have any sob stories and he didn't get any money out of it. That's the, neither he nor as a party, People think of con artists as people who are greedy. They got no money out of it. They just got pa 
power and control and the feeling of knowing that your storytelling is so powerful that you are controlling people's lives, that they believe you, that they kind of, their reality is influenced by who you say you are. And that is, I mean, talk about playing God. What a huge rush. So Damara, back in the Canadian Navy, by the way, we don't know what actually happened to these people. He was very good with antibiotics. Um, and they left right away. So as far as we know, he didn't kill anyone. But there were these wonderful dispatches then that went out all over Canada saying, you know, doctor works miracles on the high seas. And Damara really wanted these dispatches because he was so proud of himself. So of course, what happened was the real doctor seer saw them and said, hey, Hi, I'm not in Korea, here I am, but I know this guy. He was in a Franciscan monastery. I met him, <laughs> I met him there, um, and that's exactly true. That's when he stole his identity. He always liked to have many identities ready. Um, and so then he complained, and so the ship's captain was told that you have an imposter aboard. He confronted Damara and denied it. He said, after everything I've done for you, you can possibly deny that I'm Dr. Sear. This captain said, I thought it was all a misunderstanding. That guy's an imposter. <laughs> and so the real Dr. Sear briefly gets thrown into jail <laughs> for being an imposter. This is how persuasive these people can be. Now, of course, eventually it all gets straightened out. Um, and Damara is recalled, and the Canadian Navy doesn't press charges. They give him an honorable discharge and say, please just don't tell anyone, <laughs> because they're so profoundly embarrassed that they hired an imposter and that you know, they actually had this happen to them. And of course, Damara is so happy to comply. He says, of course I won't tell anyone. He doesn't, and he goes back to the United States where he's from, Lawrence, Massachusetts, and promptly re-enlists in the US Navy um, as a different person, and his life continues. So you see these people, and you realize, by the way, I urge all of you when you get home to look Damara up. There's some video footage of him, and you will it will blow your mind because this guy, he's six foot four, over 300 pounds, does not look like a trustworthy individual at all. And so you realize, wow, can you imagine what a silver tongue he has because he's not someone who looks like, you know, your, your best friend. He's someone who you see and say, ooh, <laughs> that's, that, this is a guy I should be wary of. Um, and he actually, managed to convince his biographer. So we know a lot about him because of the fact that Robert Crichton wrote this book, The Great Imposter. So he knew he was dealing with The Great Imposter, and yet somehow he managed to convince Crichton that it would be an awesome idea, Crichton's wife was pregnant at the time, if she fired her OBGYN in New York and hired Damara to deliver the baby. Because his logic, he, he had spent a few months with him on the road, and he was like, oh, well, you know, he is a qualified surgeon. You know, he did all this wonderful stuff in North Korea, and he's so intelligent, and he reads all of these journals probably more thoroughly than any doctor. Why not? So he actually asks Judy this, his wife, and she luckily has not spent any time with Damar and says, are you out of your mind? <laughs> so she does not fire her doctor, and that's one commission that Damara does not get. And yet, two years later, when Damara is in New York, and at this point Judy has met him, the book has come out, there's been a movie with Tony Curtis called The Great Imposter, which is awesome, you guys should watch it. Um, and Damara has sued the family twice at this point, and guess who is allowed to babysit the kids? and take them out on the town. That's right, Judy gives Damara her daughters to take out for the day, because at this point she has met him. So she didn't let him deliver the baby, but then she lets him take care of the baby. So this is when you realize that, oh my God, you know, these stories, these storytellers are so powerful. And we are so much at their mercy. I mean, we should be very lucky that con artists are a minority in the population. I spent three years with them. 
so at the end of it, you know, when people asked, are you now totally cynical? I was like, yes, people suck. <laughs> Humanity sucks, trust no one. <laughs> Throw away the key to your door. Don't meet anyone else. Just, that's it. That's it. You know, I, for a long time, I've struggled with the question of are people fundamentally good or bad? I now know bad, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> and, then, and then it took me a while to get over it, and I realized, you know what? I've just spent three years of my life with the worst actors in the world. And the reason we believe stories, I think, is that normally stories are telling us something good, they're true, and people aren't out to get us. But in the wrong hands, they are incredibly, powerfully deceptive. And so I think that we shouldn't be cynical about all of humanity. We shouldn't give up on storytelling. I should hope not. I mean, otherwise I have a job. But we should really take the old journalistic dictum of trust but verify to heart. I think we would avoid a lot of problems if we did that. And the more you want to believe the story, the more it transports you, the more right you think it is, the more you have to do that. Even though you might not want to, because we only don't want to believe stories when they go against what we want to believe. Otherwise, we're so glad they exist. So, this is something that I'm trying to now apply to my life, you know, trust but verify. And sometimes that makes me into a really big bitch because I have had moments when I read a story about, you know, someone appearing, um, you know, victim of abuse. I'm like, hmm, really victim of abuse or is that Samantha as a party? Um, and I actually have an alert out for Samantha as a party. I get a Gmail alert, you know, whenever anything happens. And lo and behold, about a month and a half ago, her name pops up in my inbox. She likely knew I was going to be incorporating her into a talk of mine, so she wanted to accommodate. Um, and she had, in, this time in Australia, taken advantage of an American roommate. She th said that she was an 18-year-old teenager. They met in a hostel. Um, she ended up having this girl deported from Australia for creating fake IDs because she had convinced her that Interpol was out to get them and had managed to basically get this girl to commit a criminal act, get deported from Australia. She, she's ruined her life because she thought that she was helping out a new friend on her exchange to Australia. So, trust but verify because once again, Stories are only as good as their teller. And I think it's up to us, the listeners, to make sure that the only stories that get propagated, the stories that become truly powerful, are the stories that deserve it, and not just the stories that we want to believe. Thank you so much.